to take a look at the documentary, The Tartarian Meltdown, Part 1. Um, this documentary is a recommendation by the Eagle-Eyed Crew, uh, that is uh, uh, one of the Meltology research groups. The other research group is the Phoenix Eye Crew, which is headed by Jerry DeCamp, and their documentary that they um, want you to watch. Uh, to understand what they're talking about is called When the Buildings Cry. The Eagle Eye Crew's uh, the documentary that they recommend for you to understand what they're talking about is called the Tartarian Meltdown. Now, that being said, I saw this documentary um, a year ago or so, and when I saw the documentary, um, I probably watched on Fast Forward because I watch things on Fast Forward that I'm not real interested in. Um, now, I, I thought it was interesting, but um, I really didn't analyze it. Uh, and I moved, you know, moved on and uh, didn't pay much attention to it. And recently I've uh, started to look at Meltology. Um, I am finding major discrepancies in their research. And um, I am, I, I, I think, I believe that there are melted buildings in our realm. I believe we are on a, a flat earth. Um, I don't believe that our earth works the way that we're told. Uh, I do believe that mountains are mountains. I do believe that there are some uh, mountains that are buildings, but most mountains are not, in my opinion. Uh, I believe in the possibility that uh, volcanoes possibly could be buildings. Um, I have stated this many times. Um, I have tried to um, debate this with the Meltology researchers and they flat out uh, turned me down and would not answer the questions and told me to go watch their documentaries. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, I was uh, researching the, melt, uh, the uh, Tartarian Meltdown documentary tonight and about an hour in um, I'm taking notes and I he came across a uh, photograph of a uh, what looks kind of like a castle or a, a house that's kind of castly and he was claiming that it is melted um, and uh, he was saying it was ugly and it, it just really struck me it struck me because it, the house to me was not ugly it was it was quite beautiful in its own way so I decided to do a little digging to see if I could find any information on the structure and I'm going to share my findings with you in this episode. Buckle up. And uh, this one, I love this one. I love to show it. Shown it many times before in my older videos. This is, yeah, this, you see the, uh, the uh, architecture similar to what we have seen, of course, from the old world. But you can see how the bricks turn into blocks here and around here they started to get swollen heat expansion here just look at the ugly ass thing here turn into rocks stones heat expansion here as well but inside here you see the bricks still here you can see some of the bricks and when we go up here to the top bam same architecture as before perfect red bricks the top survived and the rest didn't do so well but it's still a building you can still use it but it's damaged very very badly okay now we've given the tartarian meltdown a chance to uh, explain what they think about this image and they have said that they believe it is a melted building um, and it is ugly and you know kind of why would you build this way so now i am going to show you how to research um what these meltology researchers are are doing so that you can be smarter than a melt tard um and you can get down to the bottom of what's actually going on so prepare yourself what we're going to do is we're going to go to Google Images. We're going to go to the camera. We're going to up, upload an image, browse. We're going to find the image of 
this is a snapshot from the video of that uh, structure he was looking at. Okay, first thing I see, castles in upstate New York. Okay, I don't know anything about it that at this time. 13 magnificent castles in upstate New York. Uh, okay, I've got some pictures here. And then it comes up with what looks like possible exact matches. So let's go to the pictures and see if we come up with anything. And yes, it does. It comes up with an exact match of the image. So we can go and we can look at that. And we can see, yes, here's where he was saying it's melted. You got the door over here. Okay, it's, this is the place, definitely, 100%. Now we look here, we got anything? No, nothing, no information there. Go to the next picture, is that the same thing? Yes, it is. Wings Castle. Okay, Wings Castle. Okay, we don't know what that is. That's interesting, though. Uh, da, 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 this castle bed and breakfast. Okay, keep going. Exotic places. Okay, this castle bed and, bre bed and breakfast. Okay, what the hell? Wings Castle. Okay, here it is again, Wings Castle. Okay, Wings Castle, bed and breakfast. Huh, okay, so as you're looking this up, you're going to get information. You're going to see Millbrook, New York, Wings Castle. Okay, so what I am finding is that this Wings Castle is important so I'm going to take Wings Castle I'm going to search that when I want to search Wings Castle it comes up okay now we're getting down to it we're finding here looks like a high resolution image of it oh yeah oh yeah that's good stuff Oh yeah, see that's beautiful to me. The art, it, it, this is just beautiful. I mean, it's 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 organic and it's 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 like feng shui. You know, it's 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 kind of it, it it's artistic. It's absolutely beautiful to me. And he's calling it saying it's ugly, and I, I disagree with that. So, anyways, okay, now we know this is called Wings Castle. We're pretty sure at least. So let's go to an all search. And Wings Castle comes up here. Go to Wings Castle. And they have their own web page. Now, welcome to B&B Bed and Breakfast and Tourist Information 2022. Wings Castle Bed and Breakfast. The B&B is open, however, due to the current bullshit tours and access, access to the general public are closed. Okay. Alrighty, and we're going to see if we can find any information about when it was built. Only 75 miles north of New York City. That's cool. Wings Castle guided tours. Um, another thing we can do is we can do Wings Castle search on the Google Images. Hit Maps, and we can uh, see if it comes up. And yes, it does. Wing Charming Bed and Breakfast Medieval Style Castle. Okay. This is pretty interesting. What else can we find out about this? Uh, not too much on the satellite. It is definitely in 2D. So, anyways, that's the that's what it looks like from satellite. So that's no help. We're going to move on. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you don't. So then we're going to look and see what we can find. And uh, I'm not seeing anything here, but it looked like they had more about us. Let's read that. Okay, looks like we got an interior picture here. Uh, about us driving directions below, Wings Castle was located just 75 miles north of New York City, close to the Taconic State Parkway. Okay, the castle was the brainchild of artists Peter and Tony and Wig. Wig was raised on a dairy farm adjacent to where the castle sits now. Oh, cool! The Millbrook Winery has become what was once the Wig Farm. Wing Farm, the Millbrook Winery. Okay, in in 1970. 
the long, illustrious love affair of building a castle began. The, wait, what? In 1970, the long, illustrious love affair of building a castle began. This enigma is still to this day, 50 years later, under construction. WTF? As Tony states, it has become a, a, a live-in art project. Stay here and hear the rest of the story about how the idea of the castle became a home. It was accomplished using 80% recycled materials. What the fuck? During your stay, head down to Millbrook Winery, just a hop, skip, and a jump from the castle. Then jump in your car and head to the cute village of Millbrook where you can enjoy a quiet lunch and dinner in one of the town's many great restaurants. After lunch, enjoy a stroll in Millbrook and many antique shops. Okay, so we got bed and breakfast. We got some, um, looks like some interior pictures. So I'm a little confused here at this point. Um, oh, what, was, what was that? Oh, wait, go back. The dungeon. Look at that. Oh, wow. Check that out. Okay. Now. Alright. So, we've already seen that. Okay. The chamber. Okay. The cottage. Okay. The hinge. Oh, how about that? Winery. Okay, none of this is really that interesting to me. Um, not not in my search. Local dining. Okay, that's it. Being helpful. Now, uh, now that we have found um, this information, um, now uh, what I'd like to do. Let me get back, 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 back. Get back to where I was. Okay, now we're going to do a YouTube search and see what we can find. Wings Castle, New York, off the overnight Wings Castle, an unfortunate weekend at Wings Castle. Wings Castle documentary. Wings Castle documentary. Now we're getting into something. Now, I'm going to share with you two of the documentaries that I found on this castle and I think they're going to be more than sufficient to put to rest that this building is an old world melted building once and for all and I hope you enjoy. I'm way down here anyway for the retaining wall. So this is going to take place in three stages. One, which is done. Two, which is going to be complicated. And three, I'm not going to do until the fall because as you can see, I had a big, big trench between here and the, the kitchen to do this part of the ramp. For Tony and I to have built the castle is, is meaningless. It's all, everything is basically meaningless. The house is not just Peter Wing and it's not just Tony Wing, it's us together. So there's some reason for it, I don't know. Some people come and they, they flip out, they see a fantasy, other people see something historical, other people see a museum. There are people say, I love it, but I couldn't live here. Everyone sees something different. I don't know. Like I said, all of this is totally meaningless anyway. Totally meaningless, except for the experience of being alive.
timing is everything. When I flipped this rock over and came and got it with my front end loader, the sun was setting. So the light came across this rock sideways, highlighting and shadowing these footprints. I spotted them from my tractor seat. A kid who studies this stuff came here and looked at them. We know what this guy was. He was in the Ubrantes, a carnivore. Does this footprint exist 170 million years ago? No, it exists right now. And that's what's strange. I was thinking that 170 million years from now, nobody's gonna be thinking about us, nobody. We ain't leaving nothing behind. Twenty-nine years ago, there was nothing here. This was a cow pasture on my father's farm, and I kind of fell in love with this corner of the farm at an early age and that view. When I was 17, I was ejected from school, so I joined the Navy, and I did end up in the Vietnam War. After seeing 63 shipmates get killed and getting home at the age of 21, I made a decision never to listen to anyone ever again, and I think the building sprang from that attitude of me falling away from society. My wife and I came up here in 1969 with a borrowed bulldozer. We dug a big hole on the 4th of July because the guy took off for a four-day weekend and let us have the machine. What you're looking at has been built by myself, my wife, and finally my children helping. It is also built with 80% recycled material. At the time, the original intent for the structure was an old barn with two silos. But we had no design experience. We laid the silos out too big around to give them living space, not realizing that they would look like castle towers instead of silos. When that happened, we just simply said, why not? been all kinds of people here. A lot of entertainment people, actors. I get all kinds of film students here and people that want to be in movies and this, this is all good because uh, they have the energy and they have the, uh, the innocence. This cements for the bed and breakfast. And honey, honey, the eggs are nice, but is there a peculiar odor? Why well, no, dear, I don't know. All the stray cats that my kids have adopted come and use my sand pile as a litter box. I hate to tell you how much cat dung is actually in the mason area of this castle. We were off the coast of Vietnam, and we had this guy uh, in our a squadron. His name was Rupert, and we used to tease this guy about his wife back home, who was probably, we said, with every other sailor and marine she could find, and we didn't stop. So one morning, I'm getting a cup of coffee, and he was sitting there, and he had a big knife, and he was cleaning out the suction cups of this, the flight deck shoes. And I go, hey, Rupert, how's your wife? Or I had a dream about your wife. I said, something of that nature. He looked up at me, and I could see that he had gone. His eyes were there, but he wasn't, or something. And he pulled up that knife, and I said, son of a gun, he's going to kill me. And he came up with that knife, and I dropped the coffee, and I headed for the hatchway. Of course, I tripped, and he was raking that knife down my back. And uh, he ripped my, my coat <laughs> down the middle a couple of times. And I tripped on that damn knee knocker. In other words, in the, I'm on a ship in the hatchway. I try to get through the hatch and I trip. And he drove that knife right through my foot. 
and that's how I got wounded in the war. Uh, this I picked up uh, just before they bulldozed the old barn. It's a kip cutter from Waterloo, Iowa. And apparently you ran sheets of metal or something through or even fabric and you cut it. Here's cutting blades. But that's not why I got it. To me, it's a, a pterodactyl head. That's the head, the skull shape, and his long beaky mouth. I, I find it interesting since early man, his boats, he painted eyes and mouths on the fronts of his boats to scare away evil spirits and sea monsters. The Polynesians still do it today to keep evil spirits away from the front of their vehicles. So I figure if it worked for them, it worked for me. And that's why I paint these uh, faces. It pushes away evil. Another thing they say, you know, oh, oh, you're a genius. Well, that's, that's a layman's term for removing all the work that my wife and I do. It's 1% thinking, and this whole business of our life is like 99% labor or work. I hate that word because it, it, it eliminates the 99% work, as if it goddamn comes easy to us. It doesn't. We work. My wife works. I work. We get hurt sometimes. Machines break down or you cut something and it don't work out the way you think. I'm a firm believer in work, but I was raised with a work ethic, and I think that's what's lacking in this country now. I mean, if you're going to build a house, it's got to look like something. Why not a castle? This is the story of an idea. One that begins as a simple doodle on a napkin, but grows over time into this wondrous structure. It's truly magical. In a small town setting. It's just a, one of these unbelievably unique structures built by a single man. He's crazy or brilliant. I don't care what anybody thinks of me. It is the story of how one man's patience, perseverance, and sheer stubbornness transformed an entire community. Welcome to our community. Welcome to Millbrook. It's a great destination. Parks, architecture, a downtown that hasn't changed in 100 years, a small village, but with big ideas. Millbrook, New York. This charming little village nestled in the Hudson Valley is only a 90 minute drive from Manhattan. Yet in some ways, Millbrook is a world apart. Here, visitors can find peace and tranquility and an ideal spot to unwind. It's one reason why many New York celebrities have chosen this quaint village as their second home. Tourists passing through this rustic setting will also discover a number of antique shops, a sure sign the region is steeped in history. But there's one startling bit of local history that never fails to amaze visitors. A few miles from town, there's a structure right out of the Middle Ages, Wings Castle. Wings Castle represents a hundred years of building tradition. It's a fantasy, 
It's a castle. It's in our own backyard. It's a great place to visit. 85% of this grand castle is built from recycled materials. Its four-story structure covers 3,400 square feet and overlooks a magnificent vineyard. And what better location than to create a castle overlooking and dominating the Hudson Valley? It's truly magical. The man who spent 44 years designing and building this medieval marvel and who now maintains it is self-taught artist Peter Wing. When Peter and I were dating and he proposed to me, he brought me up here and uh, on this, this beautiful site. Look at this, these views around here. Big ideas, you get big ideas, it's expansive, you get these big ideas. And he said, I'm gonna build a castle here and I'd like to put you in it. Will you marry me? Well, who wouldn't, <laughs> you know? A castle, yeah, that sounds cool. You'll feed any line to a girl to get her attention. I said, I'll build you a castle. <laughs> I, I really, at the time, probably didn't think it would be anything like this or it would come true. All's fair in love and war, and I suppose, you know, making up wild stories like that counts, you know? But Peter Wing's wild story becomes reality, and with his new bride by his side, Peter takes the first steps to realizing his dream home on a piece of land he inherited. I mean, if you're gonna build a house, it's gotta look like something. Why not a castle? Peter and Tony Wing want to build their own home, except they lack two important things, money. If we had $300 between the two of us, it, it, it's probably saying a, a lot. And an architectural plan. We, we, had, we knew we had to go to the town board and get a permit. The permit says, supply a picture of a house. It didn't say supply a picture of the house you were going to build. Nothing of the sort. It just was quite simple, supply a picture of a house. And we go down there and we're, we wait our turn and we go into this room and there's this big table and these people sitting there. And they said, what are you here for? And we said, well, we want to get a permit to build a house in, in the back acreage of the old farm. And they said, well, all right, what are you going to build? I guess people go there with, with more preparation than we did. But we, Peter had a sketch pad with him and a flare pen. He's always got a sketch pad and a flare pen. This is his trademark. And he flipped it open and he went. So I drew a house with a door, two windows, a chimney, and smoke curling out of it. And here's a house. Turned it around and he went this. I still have that picture in my cellar way hanging right there, the picture he showed the town board. And they went, okay, fine, that was it. Today, by and large, he would have to provide the blueprints and all of the details before he could even begin construction. That's a difference of a generation. It was every square inch by design. Peter, ha I have sketchbooks that are stacks and stacks, uh, which I cherish because every section, every little part of this house, he sketch out. He would sketch it out, He'd sit there at night and sketch it out. He would, you know, I'd say, Pete, what's going on over here? And then he would just, he would just take a blank piece of paper and draw a diagram and, and show it to me. So this is what I want it to look like. And the line would go here and there, and all of a sudden it, it would develop into what you see here. Mostly it was getting the shapes, the rough framing done, and the plumbing laid out, and the electrics run, and all of this. Not that he knew anything about building, but it just seemed to come natural. Where the pipes go, where the electrical go. When you look at the mechanics that have to go into it, the structure itself, if he wasn't too sure he overbuilt it, you know, just to make sure that he was, it was in safe territory. We thought, truthfully, we thought it would take us two or three years to fulfill the, the dream of building a castle. That's how young and naive we were about what we were starting here. We started with this first section. Tony and I took down a barn in 1969, and we got erected here, the frame, in uh, 1970, and there we went. 
From there, 1971, this, this taller tower was framed. Looked like a barn still, so that three-quarter sort of tower was added. You know, and this is just the rough shapes. The stonework came much later. And, uh, you know, it's just been a progression of what's called organic architecture. Peter would work from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. on this house seven days a week. I would work my job, come home, and work alongside of him after work and weekends. But she would mix cement by hand. She did all the stupid stuff, you know, kept stuff picked up, clean parts, uh, dipped the shingles, cut the shapes out. Um, if, if it was insulating, we'd do it together, or, or I'd insulate and he'd be putting up the studs right ahead of me. You know, whatever it took, we just did it. And we just name it, she did it. Or help with, with anything, really. So she worked uh, as hard as any, anyone else would on the building. It, it was just persevere, persevere, persevere. You know, they were like one. Every one of those shingles you see, all those cedar shakes, she hand dipped them in a barrel of, of, of that red paint by herself, then hung them out to dry, and then handed them up to him, and so he could pack them onto the roof. Everything, they, you know, she was a, well, she is this building. The building wouldn't exist without her. You know, this is Pete's tribute to her, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great love affair on top of that. We had no money to do this. We just had lots of ideas and energy and really the thought that we could do it. We lived in the basement. Uh, I don't think you could do that today. <laughs> but we actually, you know, put up the block work, capped it off, and lived downstairs. We had a furnace, we had running water, and we kind of camped for three years. It had the well pump in. It was just a one I think my father-in-law found on the dump. We didn't have a stove for about two years, but uh, we had a hot plate on and off. It was a tin box and it had a drawer on it. You pulled it out and pushed it in, it would bake. If you flipped it over, pulled the drawer out, put the drawer back in right side up, it would broil. It was a bigger broiler and that was our stove. And we had a little refrigerator and just, you know, can't rough. We didn't realize it wasn't convenient, you know what I'm saying? Six dogs kept us warm. You know, we didn't need ex extra comforts beyond that because truthfully, if we were awake, we were up here working. We were, we were doing something that was one step closer to finishing this. We just decided we'd have to find affordable things that we could build with, which turned us toward recyclable things, things that people were discarding we could afford, basically. People would look at us like, why do you want to buy that old barn? We took down 11 old barns together, dismantling them just for the beams and the floorboards and anything we could salvage and use. We went to um, the Wreckers in Poughkeepsie when they were tearing down the lower Main Street and said, we want to buy some of these old used brick. And they looked at us like we each had two heads, like, why do you want this disgusting old stuff? We just like it. It just so happened that urban renewal was going on in the Hudson, so there was our endless supply of building materials. Take it, get it out of here. The price was right, it was free. In the 1960s and 70s, the construction industry went through a period of major change. Innovative prefabricated materials started appearing, and that kick-started a renovation craze. Peter and Tony now have access to a wealth of discarded materials, ideal for building their castle. My sense is that Peter was a product of time and place. It meant the opportunity to um, scavenge for all kinds of stonework, windows, trims, doorways, things that would have been tossed into a landfill. It is built with 85% recycled material, and the price was right at the time when we first got married. There was tons of stuff being yanked down all over, and people would say, just take it, take it, get it out of here. You know, quite often we'd get a whole little building, you know, and the deal was just when you're done, make sure it's all seeded and grass grows and like it was never there, and it was a good deal for us, you know, it was simple. What is also unique at this time is they can get their hands on just about anything they needed, anywhere they find it. Took dynamite and blasted a railroad bridge to loosen the huge stones so he could truck them here to put them around the house. It's brilliant because here he is recycling things and I, I'm not saying that in a, oh, he's such a green guy, that's not what I mean. He, he just would see something and know what to do with it. No one saw them as treasures when he collected them. Bringing them back, putting them into his confection, 
Did he know in advance how he'd use them? No, but that's the curiosity that represents Peter. I admit it. We are both hoarders. Tony is a hoarder. I am a hoarder. There's no doubt. There's no question. I admit it. Was this normal? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it wasn't normal, but it wasn't commonplace, you know. Um, so it was, it, it was kind of out of the ordinary, what we were doing, for sure. It, it was definitely not seen as normal, what we were doing in the 70s. Peter just did things at the time that people thought maybe were a little bit too far out of the ordinary. They would, they'd look at you like you're totally crazy and, you know. He'll start out sometimes and I'll think like, Ugh, I don't know what he's doing now and it's really weird and I don't think this is going to work out. They were kind of scratching their heads and saying, oh, these two. Depending on the generation, depending on the age, he's crazy or brilliant. He's odd or imaginative. I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I don't care. I don't care. You're on this planet one time. Don't you get it? You got 70, 75 years. If you're lucky, I'm going to do what I want with my life. I'm going to do what I want. Three years after the first shovel bites into the ground, the main structure is complete. It is made essentially of wood and brick. But for purists, a true castle is neither wood nor brick. When castles are brick, they're called an armory. I don't care how you cut it. They call it, oh, look at the cat. It's not. It's an armory. It's made out of brick. It just, castle implies something, you know? And castles are stone. There's something about the solidity, you know, of a castle. They're in poems. They're in music, kids' fairy tales, movies, novels, and history. I mean, the, and the Tower of London has got to be one of the most impressive castles in the world. William the Conqueror brought over some stone for the castle on boats all the way from France. He also used a type of stone, a limestone that's hardened. It was called ragstone. He first built the White Tower with rounded arches, you know, the buttress and the long ones to help keep support of the heavy stone walls. Peter is fascinated with the history of the Tower of London. The White Tower was built in 1078 and served as both prison and palace for royal families throughout the ages. William the Conqueror ranged over hundreds of miles searching for just the right stones for his castle. Not surprisingly, that kind of commitment is a major inspiration for the builder of Wing's Castle. The Tower of London has been there for almost a thousand years now, but the history of the place just kind of slaps you in the face. It's really, you know, brings home the idea that a structure made of stone can withstand time elements. Peter is determined that his own castle will get the same royal treatment. His will also be made of stone. But it means that building it will now take many more years than he planned. For every large stone you see, that's roughly one day work. Uh, that, that'll count as one day's work because at the end of the day when you got done, there's one big stone set and maybe 10 little ones, but behind some of these big stones, there's 30 stones, you know, it just was an endless sort of process. When you're moving stone the size of a refrigerator, it's a whole different ball game than when you're moving stone that you could, you could manually lift. Construction begins with the stonework for the garage and the patio. Then Peter sets the stones that become the outer facing of the tower. So it's a durable product that was laying around. I love it. Everyone's different, you know, challenge. If things that aren't challenging a bit to me, I, I don't like it. I'm not interested. I like challenge. I like challenges of things. His next challenge is the tower that houses the kitchen. The stonework then continues at the rear of the castle on the north tower. Then his attention turns to the tower on the right wing, the tallest of the towers. I rolled them up the hill, and then I let them roll down, and where they landed is where they, I set them. I think there's a correlation with what Peter's doing and Sisyphus, pushing the, the stone up, you know? And he's frozen in time, pushing the stone up. A very slow process, very slow, very tedious, very grueling. Always working with stones, Peter finally gets around to erecting the site for some ruins. 
and then building the moat. Even our friends coming up here would go, look, Pete, why don't you just do it in brick? It'll be quicker, <laughs> you know, get it over with. Um, yeah, we just, he just said, no, I, I like these big stones, you know. The challenges of working with stone is really very obvious. It's really heavy. And after a while, you start, it's, it's, it's fighting against your body and your body is like getting older and older and it's harder and harder to work with this heavy, heavy stuff. It took the balance of 22 years to go outside and put the stone around the circumference of this, this castle. Altogether, Peter lifts nearly 500,000 stones, most of them with his own bare hands. I mean, it's, he's my age, and he's still going. The stones are getting smaller, if you notice, from, from the start to the end. But that's, that's just natural. You can see, like, oh, God, he was 25. Oh, here he is, 40. Now here he is, over to hell. Uh, about seven years ago, Peter announced that he'd like to, to sell the castle. I said, enough. I just, I'm working all the time. And besides, this is all basically meaningless, whether it's my life or whether it's this or that. It's absolutely meaningless. I think he just got to the point where uh, he wanted to change. He just wanted off the farm. He wanted out of here. I would have liked to go on to Europe, you know, see the world, Italy, India, I don't know, Japan. So we put it on the market. We got so upset and depressed as a family. We were just like, oh no, what would happen if they move? Somebody could come in here and buy this and truthfully bulldoze it down for the property. In a hot real estate market like Millbrook, buyers are always on the lookout for properties that offer a panoramic view. Tony's concerns are justified. She has to convince her husband to reconsider selling something that means so much to so many. 36 years of your life, my life, our children's lives, uh, we put everything we had into this, all our energy, all our money, um, you know, and this is art. This isn't just a house that you're selling. This is art. This is a live-in art project. Tony said to me at one point, he thinks he's going to sell it, but I'm not leaving. And I thought, yay! Do you know? And I thought, like, yeah. And Tony, you know, Tony... Tony's the boss sometimes. Tony Ann didn't want to sell. So she insisted on an extremely high price. Tony comes up with a plan. She inflates the selling price of Wing's Castle with the expectation the cost will deter any potential buyers. She hopes that this will allow Peter enough time to reconsider selling. Well, I'm wearing out. Maybe she still had a little bit of zest. I don't know. Tony's strategy works like a charm. Less than four months after putting their castle up for sale, Peter changes his mind. He just looks at me and he said, you don't sell something you love. You know, you always read someplace, the grass is always greener, but you always come back to this, you know? And, uh, and I think this is as much Tony and Pete as it is some stone and wood. But... What do you climb Mount Everest for? It takes you years to save the money, <clears throat> tons of money, go over months to get Serpas or whatever those guys are, get up, and you're on top of that hill for about two minutes or you're gonna die if you don't get off of it. So all that crap, to be up there two seconds. All this crap, to see that for five seconds. Worth it. Big time worth it. Wing's Castle is considered one of New York State's great treasures. It sprang to life from the imagination and determination of a native son born in the Hudson River Valley. Settlement in this region dates back to the 18th century. Today, it features horse farms and vineyards amidst its rich heritage, making it an ideal setting for a castle. Growing up in this area, Peter would have seen and experienced a number of extraordinary buildings. His day-to-day -day trip to school would have passed stone Bavarian chateaus, gatehouses with portocellus, uh, the Bennett complex, which is an, an incredible facility in stone and turrets and towers. German-style castle barns and gatehouses and bridges and all of this. And you would see all this stuff every day. 
and you know, it just affected. I, I love those bullets. I really, and to this very day, I still like them. You know, they're great. They got stones that are preponderous. His entire environment was one of fantasy, and that fantasy exists today. So many people who've never been here arrive and are in wonder that the building, that the community still maintains its presence. It's a step back in time. In addition to its old historic roots, Millbrook has plenty to offer to the newcomer. Yeah, Millbrook's a fantastic place to visit. We have countryside, beautiful countryside to look at. We've got estates in and around to, to look at. But we also have Franklin Avenue that's got beautiful antique shops. You can go over to the traditional diner and have yourself a burger. You can go up to Babette's and have a, a really nice scone. You can go over to Slam and Salmon and see what they have to offer. And also go up to our winery that's nearby, have a wine tasting, beautiful spot up there. It's a spot Peter Wing knows very well. After all, it's where he was born. Well, this used to be the Wing Dairy Farm. Uh, way back when we purchased this property in 1979, it was a and, uh, bankrupt dairy that was owned by the Wing family. We are celebrating our 28th vintage in uh, uh, 2013. Um, our wines, since we're in a cool climate here in the Hudson Valley, our wines have a tendency to be more French-like, um, better with food. So our style of wine is, is very well balanced, a lot of fruit, uh, meant to be drunk with, with, uh, with food. And Peter was very, very helpful to us when we purchased it to get the winery up and running. Peter, over time, built his house on the hill uh, above us. And uh, to this day, it's, it's part of, uh, in many ways, part of Millbrook Winery because there's, there's, castle, uh, there's a castle on our hill. Hello, I'm gonna tell you about the place now, Wings Castle. Twenty-two years to build what you're looking at. It has been primarily built by myself, my wife, you know, my children helping. Copper is just all invented. That's a doorknob there, and that's a water tank float. And you get on the top; those are toilet bowl uh, floats. So it gave us a flush roof line. The ironwork, uh, the gate was ten bucks. It was from a, a picker. This entranceway is loosely based on Asian, Tibetan, Chinese, Japanese designs. People say, is that the front entrance? I, I really, after all these years, I still don't know what we consider the front entrance, you know. The archway was added, and then the, uh, the upper ruins, and, and it's based on an Irish ruin called the Inch Mahon Priory. It's on the west coast of Ireland, you know, a monastic thing that decayed, and we copied that. <laughs> you're better off copying a real ruin than you are trying to invent one. So that's what we did there. Peter and Tony are generous neighbors. After the tourists leave, local residents are welcome to enjoy the site. When Pete and Tony put in their swimming pool, that was their moat, and they, they had a moat warming party. So we went, when my children were very little, my daughters were little, and we went up and swam in the moat, and it was a nice evening. People don't very often get to swim in a moat, I guess. Our son had the unique privilege of being invited to swim in the moat of the castle. For us, my wife and I, the thought of going to a house and swimming in a moat was unique. Peter and Tony both encouraged us and invited us to be involved as well. The idea of the moat, like most ideas, it's a flash in the head, it's like a millisecond of an idea, but then it took 14 years to complete. It started before my children were born, probably, and they were like 14 or 15 before the moat was finished to jump in it. You know, I always wanted to pull why, I don't know, the time and the money and the maintenance that goes into this. I could swim in the south of France in the Mediterranean, you know, every summer, you know. A little unsightly this time of the year, but it's quite nice during the summer. Let's make our way inside the castle walls to look at some of the more private places that are off limits to the general public. The bathroom was built in the shape of a four-leaf clover with unique fixtures in every corner. In this one, a metal cauldron serves as a bathtub, fit for a king.
Well, uh, this is the kitchen, and uh, it's where we spend most of our life, I think. Where else can you walk two feet and get ice cream? You know? Everything that's hanging in here, we have basically found at tag sales, garage sales, old farms, farmhouses, as they've sold out in the last 30 years. And uh, the floor itself is from a, um, a winnowing floor, a threshing floor in a barn. These boards are two and a half inches thick, and uh, they're probably the oldest boards we have in the house. They're so hard, I couldn't saw them with a saw. They're just so petrified. Cupboards above, they're from a barn we took down, and Tony brought them here. She cleaned them and then she repainted them. She copied an antique uh, cupboard that she saw in a museum that she liked. This is a porcelain wood stove. It's um, 1900, 1905, someplace in there. Uh, originally burnt coal, but I, I fixed it so it just burns wood. Tony's actually baked pizzas in there, and I don't know why, but for some reason, it actually tastes much better coming from a wood stove than the electric one. The window over here, that's from a church they took down in Hyde Park. It was called the Regina Chaley Church, and uh, they built a modern church, it's ugly, but we got the windows 40 years ago. And this is uh, Trudy, and Trudy is a blue and gold macaw. We've had her now 39 years, I think, and my kids hate her, because uh, the screaming she does. We know she's at least 101 or two years old. That's a minimum. She might be even a little older than that. Stop it. the kitchen this is like the living room or the grand hall whatever people call it above you is a barn frame 1820 1840 it is the first building that tony and i took down 1969 we did it ourselves it took about six days uh, the horse up there is 1905 we never touched it if you look it has its first original coat of paint we, we kind of guarantee you will not see that again this is our ship's balcony but no part of it is a real ship. The ribs of the boat came from Emily Stout's Victorian porch. The rest is simply barn board, beam, and some old porch posts. A little further in here, we have a, a collection of helmets. There's about 75 on display. Right here is a, a suit of armor. It's Persian, except for the gas mask. It's Russian from the 60s Cold War period. It's just for their entertainment. This is our uh, fireplace here. And it's, you know, all used brick. In other words, it's entirely recycled, except for the mortar, of course. Balcony behind it is a uh, little walkway, and uh, the whole family could hide up in there. And to walk into Peter's environment, everything there has a story, and Peter is more than willing to share. To be able to see how he's used his imagination with those artifacts, is truly exciting. There's always some little thing that you can look at, you know? It's eye candy. Millbrook is a tiny village of 1,500 residents nestled at the bottom of a rural valley. But to visit Peter Wing's castle is to travel back in time. I saw Gaudi's work. I was a kid in a sailor's uniform. I'm in Barcelona. I had a few drinks come down a sidewalk, and it was like, whammo, who melted that building? How did that building melt, you know? We never saw anything like it. So I, I never heard of the man before. The work of Spanish architect Antonio Gaudi becomes an added source of inspiration for Peter. Uh, he was influenced by shapes of nature. You can see that in the use of his stones, his sculpture, organic forms. I think his most famous quote was, there are no straight lines in nature. There's definitely a playfulness to this style, and he was using recycled material way before it got trendy to do that. People have, you know, made some comparisons between some elements here at the castle, his work, and the use of broken tile. After discovering Gaudi's work in Barcelona, Peter becomes obsessed with this master of the Art Nouveau movement. He had all his books, photographs, and you can see, you know, in his tile work, and you can see his influence all through that. And he would get all kinds of ideas. The builder of Wing's Castle goes so far as to create a garden dedicated to his personal icon. 
he did stuff like this. I mean, you know, he influenced me. He has lizards in Park Güell. These are uh, American Art Deco tile from the 30s. And the dentist in town had eight million of these things in his cellar because he was going to do mosaics around a swimming pool. He never did. So Tony and I made literally three trips with a station wagon, and we brought boxes of these tiles home. My wife had this orange vase that was given to her, and I knocked it over and broke it. And she said, you better use this someplace. So there's the eye. That's the bottom. One of his better buildings, or bigger buildings, that just sort of hits you is the Sagrada Familia. It's a, it's a giant church, and it's one of his most famous works. God, he spent most of his career working on it. The style of it was just a mix of Gothic, Art Nouveau, but he had his own spin on everything and really elevated design to incredible levels. This is borrowed heavily from Antonio Gaudi. It's totally organic. If you look, that's a mouth open and eyes and hair standing up. My, my guess is he knew he'd never finish the church, so he needed to set an artistic and architectural example for others to follow. You know, he's passed away at somebody else's world. I'm sure it'll be fine. You know, th th they've only been working on the church for 150 years, something like that. So I'm sure it'll be another 150 before it's finished. He's at a point now where, you know, he's, he's proven himself. He won people over with his results. He wasn't just talking about something. He was doing it. And now, now he's an icon. He might have been crazy 20 years ago, but now he's, he's an icon of, of this area. Any small community today needs to think about what the personality of the community is. What is it that you have that may be unique? And for us, Peter's complex complements that beautifully. Everybody kind of has a smile on their face when they talk about Wings Castle. It's, it's, it's one of our very nice local, local features. Saw the sign for Wings Castle and drove in the driveway not thinking that there was going to be a castle. And it, it, was, it was really shocking, and shocking in a wonderful way, um, that there was a literal castle here. It's become such a symbol of our community that it's been used in a variety of ways. This is our Castle Hill Chardonnay, and it makes a really wonderful, chalky, flinty, lighter style, maybe Chablis-like Chardonnay. It's really a wine that's very, very well known, and it's because of the soils right below Ca uh, Wings Castle. They're very rocky and, and shaley, and, and that makes a difference in the way the grapes taste. It's been incorporated into a lot of the publicity of the community phone directories, magazines, brochures at the county history department, and tourism. Part of our yellow pages as a destination. That's Peter's drawing of the castle. Everybody respects him, and he's done a lot for Millbrook. Peter has been very active with children's um, projects. Uh, he does a haunted house. He does a Shakespearean performance, a summer camp. Peter has been involved with the Children's Shakespearean Theatre for over 35 years. Wings Castle is the perfect backdrop for a performance. The stages, the lights, the kids, the costumes. You hear them enunciate Shakespeare cor correctly, even though they're five years old. We shall never be younger. Big fire, spout rain, a false conclusion. That's, it's well worth it, believe me. It's well, it's well worth it to be in this amazing environment, which was just screams creativity. Um, and the whole town comes to watch these productions. That's what's so amazing. And it's just such a magical setting, so. Although Wings Castle is a private property, it's far from being off limits. Peter has been extremely generous in opening up his home to the people of Millbrook, so they too can share in its unique features. It, it was almost as if you built it for this purpose. Well, what other good would it be? 
if you didn't use it for something like this, right. you know? I'm glad he didn't sell it. I'm glad he's continued his, continued his project at the castle. Just, uh, the thing just grew. And it's just an incredible piece of work, what he's done, all of, with his own hands, in his own mind, just remarkable. My wife still shakes her head. She said, I don't believe who the hell comes here, you know, who you've attracted. I said, well, I don't believe it either, but, you know, they're here. Using the, t the castle as a tour, uh, a tourist attraction, evolved on its own. People started coming here in buses and motorcycle gangs and car clubs. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had the Russian embassy, the Russian consulate, and all of their relatives from Moscow. They see the Wings Castle as uh, a destination. People really understand that it's really something to be seen. Wings Castle isn't just a tourist stopover. Sleepovers can be booked in one of two bedrooms, down in the dungeon, where Peter's dream castle first took shape. Come on in. This is the dungeon room. It's the first room that we got done. A lot of people like it. Private bath. Everything's fresh, new. Telephone's 1895. It's not fresh and new. Anyway, the hardware's all contrived from junk. Oh, some of the guests complain about, oh, there's junk around. No, we built the place from junk. We're trying to create an atmosphere where you come here, you're in a castle, really a place to get away from it all. We discovered this beautiful medieval bedroom. And when we saw that, we were like, okay, we're staying. We're staying for a couple of nights. <laughs> So we got up in the morning, we had breakfast, really nice breakfast. Then in the back, we saw the actual BNB that Peter is finishing up right now. And uh, it looks really nice. And we, we had so much fun that we definitely want to go back. This is for bed and breakfast guests only. That's a common area down there. It's going to be like an old English pub or clam house. Above is a large room, larger than the others. If somebody wants to stay a week or 10 days or two weeks, you know. To meet the growing demand for overnight accommodations, Peter has converted his latest addition into a bed and breakfast. The new building is just about ready to welcome its first guests. Some people call it the Lemony Snicket House because that's what it looks like. It's designed to look very old, but, it, but it's in fact not, you know. There's upside down tree crotches. The faces are made from dead tree parts. The tin up there is from old goat barns. The door's from Craigslist. I got it about two years ago. You know, it didn't look like that. I had the hinges, I put those on, and the little circular stained glass pieces I had from broken stained glass windows. And, and you feel like you could be in Europe. That's the whole idea here. He's still creating and he's still working on it. And as long as he feels he wants to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm all for that. And I'm, I'm willing to support it and help it in any way I can. 44 years after he began, Peter's work remains unfinished. Nevertheless, Wings Castle is an achievement that will continue to benefit the whole community for as long as it stands. And that could be forever. I think that Wings Castle will continue to be a work in progress until the end of uh, Pete Tony's life. I think it'll continue to grow and expand and have new features and new, uh, new attractions. It's just a, one of these unbelievably unique structures built by a single person, a single man. And this absolutely should be on the National Register of Historic Places. We got something here. We really have something unique. This is art. This is something that you cannot take to a gallery. Uh, it's Peter's lifetime artwork. And the only way it can be seen is if people do come here. This is America. It's the land of dreams. You have to figure out a way to do it, and you will do it. You're only on this planet once. You do whatever you want with your life. I can remember this room when you can see the sky through it. And now, look at it. Mr. Pete, Tony. Oh, it's Tony. 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 Oh, skylights. <laughs> I thought it was just lack of a roof. The castle. The castle. Yeah, so the castle. The castle. I hope you all enjoyed that. I know I did. I learned something new about a structure that I've never heard of. And I, I, I 
thought it was a wonderful story. And my point to this is that by looking at a picture, we will never get to the bottom of the truth. We have to do more. We can't just grab images off the internet and take guesses at what we're seeing. If we're going to make statements that things are melted, we have to go deeper. We have to do the research. We can't just guess. We can't have these assumptions that we know what we're talking about. There is another story. There is more to it. I do believe there are melted buildings in our world. I do. But I see these discrepancies in the meltology research. And I have to point them out because I know I'm right. And I know I'm not popular with this opinion, but it has to be done. It's okay you don't like me, but you need to hear me. I am right, and I have just proved that. That being said, I really hope that we can move forward and get to the bottom of what really happened. I do not believe the X Factor so-called event happened 200 years ago. Personally, I think it happened a lot longer ago, a thousand years, more, I don't even know. I do believe there's a possibility of a, a major flood, but let's dig deeper. Let's keep going and let's get to the bottom of what really happened. We can have meltology, we can have mud flood, they can be together. And this to me is beautiful. You have been weighed. You have been measured. And you absolutely have been found wanting. Welcome to the new world. Keep the heads ringing. Keep the heads ringing. Say wolf again! Say wolf again! I've got one that can see. This is my kung fu, and it is strong. See you later!